Hello, and welcome to Construction Tech, presented by Passive House Accelerator, a catalyst of zero carbon building. We're happy you're here. We welcome all comers to our exploration of how to slash the greenhouse gas emissions of our buildings and make them more resilient to the extreme temperatures, wild weather, and grid insecurity caused by climate change. With our co-hosts, Kevin Brennan, Shannon Pendleton, Sean St. Amour, and Mark Willey, we produce this weekly series to dive into the details of Passive House construction practice with a technical focus on technique and technology in the field. New to all of this, please visit the Passive House 101 section of our website to get started. With that, please enjoy Construction Tech and pose your questions in chat for the discussion session following the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, for another edition of Construction Tech. We're very excited to be diving into embodied carbon, straw bale, and passive house tonight. So uh, yeah, buckle up. It's going to be a great show. And with that, co-host, please take it away. Thanks, Zach. Great to be on another uh, Tech Tuesday coming here from New York City. I'm Kevin Brennan and uh, proud to be here talking about another detail-oriented passive house project. I'm excited to learn about straw bale passive house as I've never had the opportunity to work on one. I'm uh, excited to hear, see the presentation from Katie and Abby. I'll hand it off to my next co-host. I'm excited. Thanks guys. Thanks Kevin. Hey, great to have everybody here. I'm Sean Sanimer from 475 High Performance Building Supply. This is a great night because we're getting to the point where we're including more organic material in our bills, looking at that material carbon uh, emissions. And this is a house where the big bad wolf will not be able to blow down. So looking forward to it. Shannon, over to you, because I don't think where Mark's joined us yet. Sounds good, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Zach. Thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Happy 2022 to all of you who are here for the first time. And if you're new, welcome. Uh, I am Shannon Pendleton, zooming in from New Hope on the East Coast in PA from Sanderson Sustainable Design. And I have the unique pleasure tonight to introduce some presenters who bring more than two decades of experience to us. Abby Musaher is an architect and passive house consultant working for Precipitate Architecture and Planning in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she is the resident BIM expert and building performance optimizer. She works for cost, constructability and resource consumption. So her specialties also include rainwater harvesting, waste heat recovery, resource efficient urban farming, and zero energy planning and design at both the building and the community scale. And as a special treat, we have here with her presenting tonight, project manager Jeanette Schaff and homeowners Katie Jones and Peter Sch Schmidt, excuse me. So Jeanette is also an AIA associate and she's passionate about her process with a focus on resource efficiency. Jeanette's designs are smart for resources and carbon, and she uses passive house standards and thermal bridge modeling as creative design tools. So welcome Uptown Straw House team. We're glad to have you here tonight and uh, I'm excited for tonight's presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us and for having us on. Um, looking forward to talking about the project, our process, sharing, our experience, lesson learned, strategies, um, and, and looking forward to a good discussion afterwards to answer what I'm sure would be lots of questions. Um, so just to start with, I'll introduce the project team. Um, with Precipitate, we have uh, myself, uh, founder Elizabeth Turner, and Janneke Shop, a project manager. And Janneke is on the, on the call, and she'll be sticking around after to answer questions tonight. Um, we did employ a straw bale expert, Andrew Morrison, some of you familiar with straw bale construction may be familiar with his workshops. Um, he's, he's pretty uh, busy all around the US. Um, we are working with Andrew Nelson of A Squared Design Build out of Minneapolis, and then MBJ for structural, uh, where was the structural engineering partner. And of course, Katie and Peter, the homeowners, Katie's uh, kind of co-presenting with me tonight. And, you know, they are, um, they're, they've been doing a lot of the dirty work firsthand on the job, packing in the straw bales. So 
they are not only our client, but a core kind of builder and collaborator on the project as well. Um, so this project had uh, a number of uh, goals that the homeowners brought to brought to bear, and I'll let I'll hand it over to Katie now to talk about about you know where this came from and um, kind of the initial process they went through. Yeah, thank you, Abby, um, and thanks to everyone for being here and for giving us the opportunity to talk about our Uptown Straw House. Um, so my husband and I, Peter, um, so we both work in sustainability. I work in energy. He works in community solar. And so we always knew that we wanted to, if we were going to build, we wanted to build as sustainably as possible. And so these were all the components um, that were going into, into this build. You know, we live in an urban lot just a mile from downtown in Minneapolis. We have a small footprint. Um, we currently live in a, in a triplex and we're building behind it. Um, and so it's going to be an infill cluster development. Uh, we don't own a car and we walk, bike and take transit everywhere. So that's a major component of, of this, um, this build um, and incorporating that. Um, we wanted to build passive, um, just knowing that we were, were energy geeks um, and try to get to net zero. And then through our process, um, we actually, we stumbled upon, um, you know, just how much, um, uh, foam and petroleum products are used in building materials and um, then decided to go a different way and are going into low carbon materials. So we'll talk about that more. So um, yeah, as I was talking about, we were designing this build um, with precipitate and we got some bids. And um, when I got the bids for the wall uh, components and had these SIP panels, I was like, why am I getting so much foam and why so much petroleum products? Like there's gotta be a better way to have low energy buildings, um, but are, that don't have high embedded carbon. And so I went to the library um, and did some research um, and realized that straw bale is an option um, and then did some more research, uh, went to a workshop with Andrew Morrison, um, actually out in Washington, um, to see for myself, is this a legitimate building form? And turns out it is. Um, there's an international construction code. There's a chapter, the S chapter on that. And just a little bit about uh, how straw bale assembly works. Um, there's two different types. First is a load bearing. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, second is a, is a, a non-load bearing. Um, we went the, uh, the, the second route. Um, the first route, you can only build one story and being on an infill lot, um, we wanted to build up. So we did a post and beam structure um, that takes the load of of the uh, of the structure and the straw bales just act as the the insulation um, of the wall, and so the the bales are set um, as uh, if you want to kind of go back one real quick um, just as a running bond, um, and then there's um, my wire mesh that's put on either side of the the bales, um, and then plaster goes on top of that. So kind of a three three piece sandwich. So as I mentioned, there is. Um, uh, there's best practices codified in this international construction code, um, straw bill or uh, appendix S. So um, if you want more details, that's there. And that has been a very critical part for us um, actually getting this through the regulatory process. Um, Andrew Morrison has, has designed or has built, um, you know, hundreds of these throughout the United States and the world. And he said Minneapolis has been the toughest <laughs> um, uh, regulatory system to get through. So this was really critical. So if you're thinking about, you know, natural builds, having some type of thing built into code is gonna be, is really important. Um, so one of the reasons we decided to go this route, um, uh, there's seven reasons I'll go through here. Um, the first is fire resistance. Um, people keep thinking like, oh yeah, it's straw, it's really flammable. And that itself is true, but we're talking about a wall, a straw bale assembly. So, you know, with a straw bale uh, sandwiched in between two layers of, or two sides of plaster. Um, and if you think about it, you know, that is really ad, uh, averse to um, thermal change. And um, the plaster itself is sand, lime, and water. Um, and that does not readily catch fire. And so it's got a two hour fire rating. And um, there have been a number of cases in California where the you know, wildfires have come through and um, homes have actually survived. You know, straw bale homes have survived those fires. So you can see on the left hand side, um, it's that house um, that you see on the right hand side, but after a fire. And you can see it's basically unscathed. Um, as I mentioned, it's got a, a really deep ther or large thermal mass. Um, the bales themselves are 18 inches deep. Um, so we have really thick walls um, that typically ends up with an R25 to R30 wall, um, depending upon how well the, uh, the baling machine <laughs> um, compresses it. It's also got really good sound dampening um, capabilities. So it's very quiet on the inside, which is nice, especially in an urban area. 
Um, and then getting to more of the environmental um, quality. So it's it's really, it's a waste product. It, so there's a difference between hay and straw. Um, so straw does not have the seed heads a part of it anymore. It's not, uh, hay is the nu nutritional product. Straw is the waste product um, after the, the grain has been removed. Um, and so it's otherwise waste and we're putting it to use. Um, and it's got low embodied energy. You can see here, just compared to some of the other typical insulation um, types, uh, it does have the lowest um, uh, megajoules per kilogram. And it uh, also, it's a, it sequesters carbon. It is carbon. <laughs> um, and so um, you can see here uh, the kind of how that breaks down. So our, our house should have about 9,000 pounds of, of carbon sequestered, which, equal, which equals about 10,000 um, miles driven or five acres of forest. Oh, and also mention you can use any type of straw um, bale to build. You can use rice, oat, wheat, um, any of those work. Um, and last but not least, so I'm really uh, involved in my community, sort of on the neighborhood board and all sorts of things. Um, and so having this as an opportunity to build with neighbors, family, and friends um, was really intriguing to me. Um, it's a simple, essentially a barn raising. And so we did that um, with, uh, so in, in October, we had at least um, 50 people at some time come through during the month to help us bail um, uh, mesh, so and, and plaster. And so here's kind of um, <laughs> an in-between part, you know, while we're building, we have to protect the bales from uh, rain. Um, you can't let the, the boy bales get West, wet. So that's why that's covered with some haphazard plastic. So um, as was mentioned, uh, you know, the big bad wolf and other um, potential concerns. So pests, pests are not an issue um, because if you plaster the wall um, thoroughly, there's no entry point into the walls. Um, for electrical, though, uh, we're burying those into the bales themselves um, where needed. Otherwise, we're putting them into interior walls. Um, and so you can do that direct burial with no problems. You do want to keep plumbing outside of the walls. Um, you, the real key is to keep bales dry. Um, and so we are putting them into interior walls or into furred out walls um, out, outside of the, the plaster walls. Um, and like I mentioned, yeah, moisture is a major um, component. And so the plaster, it's important to have lime-based plaster and not concrete because they needs to be vapor open. Um, in case the bales do get wet, they need to be able to dry. Next. <laughs> Um, and so for the construction part, um, the first part is, uh, you know, putting together the post and beam structure. Uh, we uh, then had, um, so you can see our window construction with these, with these windows and door bucks. Um, and on the bottom, um, we had to have a fairly sizable pony wall. Um, we live in Minnesota, snow drifts get high. And although it's actually not necessary um, uh, technically to have the pony wall that high, um, again, keeping the bales away from moisture, our Minneapolis uh, code officials um, were are, are being abundantly cautious, and we wanted to make sure we could get the building passed, and so we kept those up high enough um, to avoid any snow drifts. Um, but really, um, you know, with uh, the major concern with snow drifts is that if the house loses heat, um, then that mo melts snow on the outside, and that can cause leakage into the walls. But in this case, the walls are are, are very thick and um, uh, will not lose much heat, and so that isn't as much of a concern in this type. Of construction. Uh, so the next part is uh, stacking the bales into the building. Um, like I mentioned, they're, they're put in as a running bond, similar to as you, as you lay bricks. Um, we put those up. You don't want to make sure that they're not on the concrete. If you, if you are in a more mild climate with no, um, uh, no snow, um, you still want to keep it off of your, your foundation. Um, and so stacking the bales on the toe ups is really important mentioned running bond. Um, as you can see, there are posts um, that you need to actually literally cut into the bales and notch around. Um, and then the most fun part is uh, slipping that final layer into um, uh, on a floor um, into the top. Um, we had to literally use car jacks to jack the, the um, compress the bales down in order to fit that final bale in there. And that's what really gives you a nice solid um, thick wall. So the second part after putting the bales in is to shave, mark, mesh, and sew. Um, so you want to make the, the bales all the same um, and smooth on the outside and inside. Um, and then you want to mark where your, um, your electrical is going to go. 
Um, and then you put on the meshing um, and you sew. And so to, to do all of that, you literally take a weed whacker <laughs> um, to shave the walls, um, which is pretty funny. Um, and then you just use spray paint to mark where the electrical is. And then we had two by two inch mesh um, that we you know, stapled at the top, rolled down and stapled at the bottom. And you use these giant metal forks that we had hand fabricated um, uh, to, uh, to, to pull down and make it nice and taut. And then on either side of the wall, you literally take a, a giant needle that's about two feet long to thread through the wall and back on the other side and you tie a knot so that again, the mesh is really holding, you know, on either side is really sticking to the, um, the straw bales. And that's what gives you a nice um, kind of textured wall to be able to plaster well onto. And in load bearing structures, that two by two inch mesh is, um, is important for, um, for shear strength. Uh, la the last step is plastering. Um, so we used a, a plaster that is a mix of uh, water, sand, and hydraulic lime. Um, you know, if you talk to Andrew Morrison, there are options to use clay and some other um, natural materials, but this is um, what he really recommends. So there are three layers of, uh, of plaster. The first one is a scratch coat, um, just very, very rough coat. Then um, you wait 10 days, you apply a brown coat, um, and then you apply a, a finished coat. Um, so we used the same, we we'll use the same mixture for the first two coats and then um, what is just called an eco mortar. So without sand um, for that final coat to make it nice and smooth. Um, and by the end of it, our, uh, the plaster itself will be about an inch to an inch and a half thick on either side of the wall. And I think this is when I turn it over to you, Abby. Yep, thanks, Katie. Just taking a step back now, uh, uh, Katie gave us a kind of a, a quick like dive into straw bale construction, saw some cool photos um, and see the process, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, from the architect's perspective, you know, coming up with the program and the design on the urban lot and uh, those sorts of things. And then we'll jump into again, back into like the construction details. Um, so this was conceived as an accessory dwelling unit, like Katie mentioned, it's on the back of a city lot. Um, we have two bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms, uh, first floor bike garage in lieu of a car, car park or car garage, um, an upper story loft or mezzanine space, and then a large exterior balcony and porch um, off the west here. And um, throughout this project, there's this theme where we had a lot of kind of at times synergistic, but at times conflicting kind of goals. And so it's really about uh, kind of reconciling those and, you know, still trying to end up with, um, you know, a low carbon, urban, net positive building. <laughs> um, so back to the site, um, here, here on the bottom right, you can see our lot um, and the existing triplex uh, is, is to the west side of the lot on, in this Bryant Avenue. And then to the rear of the lot is up against this parking lot of this apartment building. Um, and the, the footprint of the former garage is this lighter lighter concrete square. So the new, the new building um, takes up this whole back portion of, of the lot. Um, so we kind of getting through the city's um, approvals process, it was uh, uh, applied as a cluster development um, because there are four plus units on the lot when you add the triplex and this ADU. Um, so that resulted in some um, greater setbacks and shared yard requirements. So we we were we we're kind of working against um, you know a bigger massed wall with tight with bigger setbacks. Um, so so trying to find the optimum uh, footprint on the site and maximize the buildable area um, with, while still maintaining some yard space. Um, and then uh, so this carriage house has a 24 foot by 28 foot interior, so it's almost square. Um, and a gross footprint of almost 2,000 square feet, but that interior condition floor area of just over 1,500 square feet. So you can really see how those mass walls uh, take up a lot of the, the floor area. Um, the solar exposure, we oriented the roof, uh, kind of the gable east-west, so we could up, you know, get the most solar, uh, potential solar area. Um, and then they do actually have this little peekaboo window in the porch roof, uh, so you can see the bifacial solar panels. So uh, kind of a, a interesting feature, um, experiential when you're sitting up there. Um, and so then the, the solar array um, will be a 12,000 uh, kilowatt hour per year array. And then there's an additional, I think, 4,000 kilowatt hours per year on the existing triplex. 
Um, so that's quite a large urban array. So this uh, accessory dwelling unit or carriage house typology, what you can see is on the bottom right of this perspective is the bike room. Um, so you come in off the side door and you have a bike wash station um, with a drain and a kind of shower stall. Uh, and then the area that's cut off, you can't see is, is coats and whatnot. So by eliminating uh, the need for a car parking um, and, and having this bike bike station, it, it gave a lot more space to this first floor for living area. Um, and some of the features of accommodating that bike is uh, the bike door is the bike door. So like a 42 inch wide side door. Um, the full asphalt drive was removed, um, but we are leaving kind of some paved, uh, pervious paved uh, tracks uh, to, to, to still facilitate, you know, access with a bike and a trailer. Um, but overall, we'll give more permeable surface to the lot. And then we're able to keep the curb cut from the car to use for the bike still in access to that side yard. Um, and then another aspect of this uh, kind of the, the, the floor plan and the concept was because they're in this back, back lot um, surrounded by fences and kind of built in, moving the living space to the second floor. So you come in that front foyer and up into this open open concept living room with a kitchen tucked in under this mezzanine. And then that spills out onto the second floor port, covered porch. So that really provides more light and air and views um, than if the living area were on the first floor. And so this, this kind of Eastern back half of the first floor are the bedrooms um, and a bathroom and laundry, et cetera, more private space on the first floor. So um, just, just a quick look at the floor plans. Um, so passive design, you know, we stuck to the box, the cube, um, compact form, uh, efficient footprint and floor plan. Um, one, one feature you'll notice here, uh, this initially when it was designed wasn't a straw bale. That was something that we pivoted to after kind of schematic design. Uh, so had we designed it as straw bale initially, we probably would have tried to keep all the plumbing off the exterior walls. But in the instance that you do have plumbing on the exterior walls, you can uh, fur out fur out a, a, a kind of a service wall off the straw bale. So you can see that in this, this right hand wall along the bathroom areas, the wet rooms. Um, and that just ensures that you're not, you know, that you're just that, that much kind of space and separation from the plaster wall from, from bulk water and, um, you know, end up having any pipes running through there either. That's something to avoid. Something that we uh, encountered uh, in the facade design. So uh, it was kind of a little bit of friction between optimizing for passive design, which is you know a greater percentage of glazing on your south and minimal glazing on the north. Um, whereas uh, per zoning, we had certain percent glazing requirements for each elevation. And fortunately the west had the highest percent, but um, that was kind of the front of the building as well. And that and with the, the, the deep overhangs and high performance windows, that wasn't too big of a, of a hit in terms of performance. But you can see on the, on the south facade, we have uh, almost 20% glazing and on the north, just 6%. Um, and so I don't remember if we got a variance for that or if that didn't end up having to apply. But it, regardless, we, we still um, kind of went with what was optimal for the passive, passive strategies. One other feature of the straw bale is having these deep eaves and overhangs. I think we have three foot overhangs to help keep snow and rain, driving rain off of the straw bale walls. And so um, that also worked in our advantage for shading, but actually on the south, it, it is almost overshading. Uh, with, uh, the, the south windows would like that to be a little bit less deep of an overhang, but part of our you know, moisture mitigation strategy for the city was you know, ensuring that we had those deep overhangs. So now I'll just look at the energy metrics a little bit for Passive House. Um, for the straw bales, we use a conservative 1.5 R per inch, um, and that's what's I think provided in Appendix S as a reference. So that kind of felt like the, the, safe, the safe R value to use. Um, I know other, you know, just from other projects, look, you know, talking to people and reading, you know, some people say that you can get up to 2.2 R per inch, and that depends on various factors, such as the density of the bale, the orientation, the straws lean in the bale, if the bales are stacked on end or on side, and then the moisture content of the bale. So uh, with like a natural material, you know, it's not, it's just not as, as exact as, as a manufactured product that you know, you get the specs for. So, so using the con conservative 1.5 R per inch, um, we actually uh, haven't been able to hit our heating demand, annual heating demand of 11.9. We're at 
20.89 um, last time we ran the Wolfie model. Um, everywhere else we we're, we're doing just, just fine. Let's see, peak heating load is 10 and we had 12. So we're a little bit over on that heating load. So um, that was a compromise. Going with the straw bale, uh, we still felt like the value of the, of the embodied car embedded carbon was much greater than um, actually hitting the passive, you know, hitting the hitting the targets for passive house uh, certification because it's still a very low load building and they have have adequate solar to offset um, and, and and be net positive. So here's our energy equation. Uh, code baseline uh, building of this design and size would be an EUI of fifty two. Um, we, uh, as designed, it's an EUI of sixteen, and this is gross floor area, um, and then. And then with the solar array on the roof, um, it certainly will be net zero and uh, quite quite likely net positive. And, and th that intent is to offset the energy of the triplex also on the lot for the homeowners. So beyond the energy, we're, we're really at our firm and, and, and it was really catalyzed by working with Katie and Peter, looking at the embodied carbon emissions in the materials that we're specifying. Um, this graphic from Architecture 2030 um, is looking at the, um, total carbon emissions of global new construction from 2020 to 2050. And so this is the business as usual, usual projection. So as we've, as we've all done a great job of reducing the operational energy and associated emissions of our, of our buildings, then the, the piece of the pie that is the embodied carbon emissions is going to make up half of those building emissions. So it starts to become um, kind of the next, the next low hanging fruit. Um, I, I grabbed this uh, graphic also from Architecture 2030, um, where it's comparing the carbon impacts of different insulation materials. And so you, we we know the foams are the are the kind of the, the they're so efficient and good at it in a small space, but they have the greatest uh, CO2 e equivalent. Um, XPS is the worst, and then some of the spray foams, and then um, uh, EPS is is uh, a better alternative um, from the foams, but down here at Straw Bale, you can see that it not only is um, low carbon, it actually sequesters carbon. It's a biogenic material um, because of the carbon in the material itself. And if that's built into a house, there it's going to be there for a hundred years. So, so this this di this this graph I think really exemplifies why Katie. Um, and Peter decided to pivot to this straw bale construction and, and just go for it. Um, dense pack cellulose, also a great option, um, but they really, they really want to explore how to build a straw bale and make it happen in the city. Um, so where, where we're at with our own LCA of the uh, straw bale house is we've run it on the exterior walls. That was kind of the biggest, biggest hill to climb because uh, Tally and the software we're using doesn't have straw bale, like very many natural building materials in its database. And so um, I was able to kind of mine uh, uh, Chris Magwood's, one of his reports where he kind of depicts how he does the calculation for the biogenic uh, kind of carbon storage capacity of, or the drawdown capacity that embodied carbon storage of the material. And so on um, just the exterior walls, um, we have uh, the associated, um, so there's the pony wall, is, is that lower 30 inches. So it's not, a, it's not just all that straw bale wall with the post and beam construction. There is, we do have some, some jet board um, and kind of more conventional materials, but you can see that the embodied carbon emissions are about 3,500, um, whereas the um, embodied carbon storage capacity is about 14,000. So our net is is just over ten thousand uh, 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 CO two e equivalent of of carbon storage actually in the walls. Now this doesn't include. You might have noticed in the construction photos um, some of that um, big metal X bracing and strapping for shear. That was uh, kind of an extra cross the T's dot the I's requirement of structural by the city. Um, even though the the straw bales themselves act with the plaster skin act in like a sheer capacity. Um, it was uh, just another another kind of layer of assurance for this kind of renewed type of construction. So, so that will that will impact our exterior wall wall formula. And then of course when we get to the foundation and EPS. So I'm I am really curious to see how the whole building balances out. But you can see that how, just how significant an impact of of these biogenic materials have on the on the embodied carbon of the building equation. 
Um, so now I'm going to jump into a section, uh, just, just kind of going through some of the details um, and just in terms of from a passive host lens, um, how the straw bale, straw bale walls are behaving and um, talk a little bit too about how, how, how this relates to the regulatory process. So here's our structural design. Um, uh, initially, we were looking at a shallow foundation. Uh, but now we actually do have, we, we did end up going just per the, con the, the builder's preference um, with a traditional, like, you know, uh, deeper foundation. But um, we, uh, you can see just the, the posts and then platform frame um, and then the parallel cord trusses. Um, those are 18 inch trusses. And then this exterior uh, deck and balcony is actually a standalone structure and it's tied back to the straw bale building at, at, at key points here at the second floor and then also at the roof it's connected. But otherwise, again, it was the idea was to limit the penetrations in terms of thermal bridging, but even with wood, wood that's not as, as, as uh, significant as if we're looking at steel and concrete, but then it was really just to kind of retain the um, integrity of that plaster skin and not penetrate it where unnecessary um, with thermal bridging or potential opportunities for moisture movement. Um, so looking at our control layers, uh, we have dense packed cellulose in the 18 inch uh, parallel cord vaulted truss ceiling and then the 18 inches of uh, straw bale wall thickness, and then this pony wall, which also has dense packed cellulose in the cavity, and then uh, EPS foam under the slab and under the footings. Um, layering on for air tightness. So the, the one inch or give or take of the lime plaster skin over the straw bales um, is, is on each side of the straw bale is, is kind of our air bear, is our air barrier layer, and then tied into uh, the, the, the roof sheathing um, uh, up in the trusses. And then um, we do have a typical vapor and air, air barrier under the slab as well. And then um, weather resist, resist of barrier, the, the, you don't layer any additional vapor or air barriers under the, under the lime plaster. That's, that's what's critical. Um, there were a couple projects in the Twin Cities that had failed and were demolished in the 90s and it's kind of folklore because there isn't a lot of evidence of it in any kind of historical documentation but it is this kind of legend that haunts the city to this day and I think one of the what, what is said is that there was mold and issues related to um, you know Im improper uh, detailing and I think adding additional layers to to uh, prevent water from coming into the bales, where is it actually kept it in, right? The moisture. Well, and they let the bales get rained on. <laughs> and they let them get rained on, right. So part of this weather resistive barrier is, is, our, uh, is our three foot eaves, um, right? Keeping, keeping driving rain and then the pony wall to keep the straw bales up off of grade, a good distance from snow. And then uh, the, the lime plaster that then does let the moisture kind of, it, it can kind of come in, but it also diffuses back out. Just again, revisiting um, the, the straw bale really took priority in terms of its 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 detailing and the proper installation and uh, for durability, and so um, that that you know as we were weighing the different project goals throughout this process, um, that one that one really came to kind of drive a certain you know to a certain extent. So uh, one aspect where we uh, kind of changed a little bit from what would be a more conventional post and beam straw bale infill wall is we inset the posts um, to the inside of the straw bale. I, I think maybe in that diagram of this from the appendix S code that Katie had at the front end, I think you could see the post to the exterior of the straw bale, but we wanted um, continuous exterior insulation. So we justified the post to the inside of the bale and, and notched from that angle. Um, but then uh, to compensate for that, you might've noticed in the construction photos and we'll see some more coming up here. We had to devise a system of plywood bucks that kind of, that held the, the, the door and the windows out from the post to the to kind of face of the bales. Um, so, so we, we solved one problem, but kind of created another design challenge. But uh, in the end, it seemed like quite an elegant solution, um, the way we're able to kind of 
and, and not un, uncommon in passive host construction with the thicker cellulose walls either. So just looking at the, we'll run through some of the key details here. Um, so roof assembly is an R70. Uh, we do have a metal roofing and, there, and it's meant to be uh, reflective as there are the bifacial solar panels on the roof. And so um, definitely want to uh, maximize the uh, solar energy potential there. And then um, part of the directive to um, avoid uh, high embodied carbon uh, material embodied carbon emission materials was also to avoid you know sheet goods when possible so we did use plywood for the structural bucks for the doors and windows but in lieu of um, other sheet goods we we just used one buys um, for uh, the roof sheathing um, uh, kind of a, a two by six vented uh, cavity here and then our our thermal boundary um, we have uh Vapor open building paper, one by 10 roof sheathing, and then 18 inch thick truss with dense pack cellulose, and then um, air tightness layer, uh, vapor open building paper, a two by four service cavity, and then drywall, um, and then tongue and groove wood ceiling. And you know, the, we would have liked to um, just have the wood ceiling, but uh, part of the city's requirements and code, you know, we had have that drywall layer there as well. So. Um, in some instances, it feels like there may be some duplicative materials, but again, balancing um, um, kind of all of the all of the competing demands. Um, let's see here. I'll jump to the next detail. So, uh, straw bale wall assembly. Um, so, the the overall wall assembly we estimate to be around R24. Um, so, we have a lime stabilized plaster on the exterior that and that's applied in the three coats. Um, a galvanized wire mesh, and then the 18 inch straw bales, they're stacked to compress a minimum of two inches. So we set our kind of increments of uh, uh, kind of building blocks per the height of the bales compressed. So our, our depth about between the pony, the height between the pony wall and the kind of uh, top uh, beam is, is the height of the bales less enough to equal the compression, you know, to get them all sandwiched in there. Um, and then another uh, interior coats of the lime stabilized pla plaster. And try to try to drag some construction photos over here to show. So this is the view from the inside at this at this second floor. Um, you can see it because this is open for the stairwell there. But this is that uh, separation between the first and second floor right here. And then the pony wall assembly. So it is an we estimate it to be about an R eighty. Um, honestly, it was just filling the void space. The reason it's so deep is because it is a kind of a structural cantilever support base to hold the bales off the ground, but also hold them out and can create a line of continuous insulation that wraps the, the foundation and then up and kind of connects with the straw bale. So um, the, I'm not sure what the final material at this point, this we, we were looking at a masonry thin veneer system um, and, and, you know, De depending on what the material is, um, may or may not have this extra insulation here, but then um, wood fiberboard and then uh, vapor open building paper, the wire mesh kind of connecting, just connecting that uh, uh, straw bale plaster layer kind of to the pony wall. Um, and then another layer of insulated sheathing. We have our 18 inch pony wall framing with dense pack cellulose. Um, in, another layer of insulated sheathing, and then uh, building paper, and then the plaster and and the metal mesh coming down uh, to continue the same interior finish material from the straw bale down the pony wall. Um, and then we have eight inches of rigid EPS wrapped uh, around the foundation. So this um, just to kind of add some clarity. This this kind of shaded triangular uh, shape in this pony wall is is again kind of like similar to the uh, kind of canted sheeting that we used for the structural bucks for the windows. It's also kind of carrying the load back and down uh, for the straw bale. And then this, uh, can tell we, we, we talked about moisture a lot in our, in our kind of conversations with the city um, and, and kind of proof, proving the science, you know, and then also uh, using the belt and suspenders approach. So, um, to really protect against um, unwanted ex excess moisture intruding and in staying in the bales. We have the large eaves, um, no additional vapor barrier, 
Um, bales are held above the snow line on a pony wall. And then we part of the, the reason for the, the bucks is we wanted to hold the window and, and glazing plane closer to the front of the uh, wall surface as opposed to dealing with a sill and potential areas for snow to set to set and melt and, and water infiltration at a sill condition. Um, and then during construction, um, you, you moisture meter every bale and test for less than 20% uh, moisture content. But uh, Andrew Morrison and our, our team uh, was targeting less than 10% moisture content. Um, and then you have to keep the straw bales protected from rain. So in a, in a container on site and then under a tarped or roofed building as they're being installed. And then during occupancy, there are gonna be some moisture monitors built into the walls that then can be logged and uh, Katie and Peter are, are energy and, uh, and, and uh, you know, science nerds. So the, the, they're gonna monitor this and we're gonna use it as a uh, kind of research and, and uh, ongoing learning opportunity um, in, in partnership, well, not partnership, but in, in hopes that it will support future, future builds and kind of pay, help pave the way to demonstrate the feasibility and durability of this construction. Um, so just a quick, quick overview of the mechanicals. So air source heat pump, ducted air handler, looking at Mitsubishi units, and then um, a Zender uh, ventilation unit um, with energy recovery, of course, and then two um, hot water tanks, um, one's down at the bike room, and then one's over with kind of the plumbing core, uh, tankless hot water heaters. So um, general, general, just reaching the end here, um, just in summary, uh, so, so this project really was about addressing climate change, right? It's it's low carbon architecture. So we have pass, we're going for the passive house and the passive strategies to really lower our energy load, going, trying to consider the embodied carbon um, and, and really uh, trying to resurrect the vernacular construction technology into kind of contemporary uh, practice. Um, and, and then, um, also facilitate and support kind of a more urban lifestyle that doesn't necessitate long car rides, et cetera. And so, and so to achieve this, um, it was really critical to work as integratively as, as possible um, and kind of bring in the experts and consultants when needed, um, hence, hence Andrew Morrison, hence structural engineering team um, in, in this context that was required. Um, so we considered the embodied and operational carbon, um, you know, I think Yannicka on, on the call here after can, can speak more to um, kind of her, her observations and ideas about how to um, advocate for regenerative building policy. Um, and that's, a, that's part of that's about eliminating the regulatory barriers um, that, that are limiting our ability to, on projects that are really pushing uh, for climate action. Um, and then shifting the North American market um, getting more bio-based products available. And, you know, I, it, we, since this project, we've been look, talking to other actually straw bale panel makers, you know, for future projects, like maybe it's not straw bale construction, but how can we get more biogenic materials into our kind of standard assemblies? Um, and then um, participating in research, creating the research, if it's not out there to kind of support, um, you know, the projects. And then uh, also included is the link to the straw bale appendix S. Um, Andrew Morrison, the Endeavor Center, we had good resources on embodied carbon emissions there. And then you can follow the Uptown Straw House's progress on Katie and Peter's blog. And that's that's it. Great presentation, Abby Great. and Katie. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. We've got a ton of questions, but Sean, oh, go ahead. Just saying so many great details. I think Mark's with us, Mark, any? Any insights? Uh, I would say I'm speechless with the overall beauty of the project, right? And by beauty, truly is the aesthetic, how it fits into the neighborhood, how you approached it, how you uh, executed it, and then the materials, unbelievably, just beautiful. Sorry to take a pause there. I was just getting the first names for the folks who have questions into the chat. But uh, I think, Abby, you, you made it off easy. You just had a kitten in your lap. 
you have to be ridiculous, <laughs> isn't it? It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous working from home. I'm with you. I'm with you. But you all did a great job. Um, I have a quick question for you to kick things off. When you were uh, looking at the R value calculation for the straw bales, I know you mentioned in the dry run that there were, there's a lot of different ways to calculate it based on the type of straw, the orientation of the straw, the density of the straw. How did you guys go about for this project determining what your R value would be for those bales? And then uh, how conservative were you with that? And do you think it had a big impact on heat demand in the energy model? Yeah, well, so we did just use the value that is cited in the appendix S. Um, so felt that, so yeah, it's not our bail specific. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that to me is, is a question. I don't know. I think the heating demand was still about double what the passive house target is. So, um, you know, I could I could go and test the model and see what our value would be, or you know, what yeah, what what wall our value would we have to achieve? And is even if we use an R of 2.2 per inch for the bale, would we have become close? I, I don't know. I think I think I think this this project is um it's really looking at the whole carbon story as opposed to just you know through the operational energy. And so it, you know, it's disappointing because we're you know we're we're all about about hitting our passive house targets, but because they do have net positive solar and it was more of a holistic look at carbon, um, we don't feel too bad about it. And I think everyone attending here agrees with you that the trade offs you chose were excellent trade offs and and the right ones in terms of looking at those materials so closely. You know the energy model is a tool, and yeah. it's not the only tool, and it's not the final say. Uh, but it, it's a great way to figure out why you're making some of the decisions you're making. So yeah, well done. Oh, I will, very, very nice. Go yeah. ahead, Katie. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I will add, um, you know, there are different types of bales. Um, we use two string bales. There are also three string bales, um, which are about three feet um, deep. And I, I believe, uh, what is it like? eight feet long and anyway they're they're much bigger but if you're not on an urban lot it is another option I believe I actually saw um when I was doing research uh they were using the bigger bales um in uh for a four-story straw bale build in Germany and so you can use bigger bales and you know attack um or get some of these um the yeah. attack some of these values that you're trying to get to. if I could jump in and just say it would be great in future presentations to see what the the, uh, if you guys measured the R value, I know there's a way to take a heat flux sensor and uh, the green tag, I think makes one that I've been trying to get my hands on, but it would be amazing to see what the actual installed R value of these panels are. So then we can take real world data, like a blow a door test and say, this is the R value of our wall based on this design yeah. criteria. It would 100%. be pretty cool to see. Yeah, and yeah. can we do it retroactively? I know you're moisture sensing everything, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and it's such a teaching tool, you know, the design process, the build process, and they had a lot of first timers uh, on the build side too. So workforce yeah. development, but that community piece where you're using it as a teaching tool is, is going to allow it to live on in a, in a low carbon way in another site very soon, I'm sure. So uh, let's jump into the questions. Our first one is from Whole Systems Design Collective. I don't have a name to go with that, but it's a great title. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hey there, sure, yeah. Um, I was just curious if you guys had considered um, any panelized construction strategies or if the kind of hands-on community built focus was a part of your design process from the outset. Yeah, so we had, or so I had looked into it um, partially when we were just looking for it, for contractors, like who does straw bale anywhere in the Midwest? And literally there was no one. <laughs> the closest that I could find was someone in, um, oh, and was in Colorado and then like Chris Magwood in, um, I believe he's in Ontario. Um, so yeah, it just wasn't even an option. And so honestly, the either trying to teach or trying to get our, our contractor A squared to do this themselves um, was going to be our option or we do a community build. So, yeah. Yeah. And at the time, um, I wasn't familiar with any uh, straw panel construction, but I since then, um, is it for 
new frameworks in Vermont that does straw panels. I, we talked to Griffin the other day and that looks really cool. I would love to employ that on another project. Excellent. Thanks for that question. And Thank we you. have our next question from Joe's iPhone. Joe, would you like to unmute? And if you can't unmute for any reason, I can ask your question for you, Joe. Joe wanted to know, uh, he said, there's no drainage plane on the stucco system, question mark. I, I wanna try to answer it, but I'm gonna let you guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yannicka, I'm gonna call you in to, to speak to the detailing. Hi there. <laughs> Um, Hi, Monica. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> um, there's actually, it's actually not recommended in the straw bale stressed skin system to have an airspace behind the plaster layer. So while it, it's it's a different, like the, the science of the wall performs differently, and it's actually um, performs differently than a traditional plaster system, like an Eve system that we see in passive houses. And we're actually, the, the science working is dependent on the real areas reliant on the system layers being right next to each other. That is one of the potential reasons, we don't have any official documentation, but one of the potential reasons why one of the failures that Minneapolis cited um, and made them nervous about straw bale, they had a, a rain screen cladding system and the bales, they had gotten wet prior to the install of the wall, which is another problem, <laughs> but then the, um, the rain screen actually allowed that moisture in the straw bale system to proliferate. If you have a stressed skin system like this, um, the plaster layers have to be properly done and they have to be continuous and they have to integrate with all of the wood connections um, in a way that maintains air tightness. So all of those things really support passive house too. Um, so that's why there's a lot of synergy, but we, I, I don't know. I was looking actually, because I saw that question in the chat, I was looking for some official advice from our straw bale expert, because he has a lot of resources on his website on whether or not he advises a rain screen system. Um, and I couldn't find anything, but I'm sure if we asked him, he would have an opinion on it. So we can we can dig around and, and get back to get back to you if you have more, if you're wanting more on that one. Excellent, thank you. Well, we are almost at the top of the hour. So with that, I'm going to hand things off to Zach and we will be back in just a few minutes to do the rest of the Q&A. Thank Ken. you. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Katie, for your leadership on making this house happen. And to Abby and the, your team, I'm just a even bigger fan of Precipitate and its work. It's just this has really been a fantastic evening and super inspiring to see this project. So thank you. I've got actually a, a, an important announcement to make, um, and I'm going to get to that soon. Before I do that, I also have some important thank yous to make. So I'm going to share my screen here and thank the organizations who make the Passive House Accelerator possible. So a big thank you to founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Thank you also to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Prosico, and Sega. And thank you to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thanks too to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Aero Barrier, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Enotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owen, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. So thank you, sponsors. On the Past Files podcast, we have a guest appearance from our guest hosts, Mary James and Ilka Cassidy, and they interview Anne Vogt from uh, a Madrid-based Vand Architectura, uh, and they talk about uh, Anne's uh, training in Germany and her work in Spain uh, and the leadership that, that, her, that she and her firm are playing in the kind of uh, uh, blossoming of multifamily passive house um, and single family passive house in Spain. On the podcast uh, uh, topic, we just want to uh, announced that we are going to hit 100,000 downloads tonight. 
uh, we're at 99,929 downloads right now. So it's super exciting to see how successful this podcast has been. A big thank you to all the guests who have been part of the podcast, as well as to um, Matthew Cutler Welsh for uh, bringing the concept to us in the first place. So um, pretty exciting. Okay, we also, another exciting thing is we have our, our new issue of the Passive House Accelerator, Accelerator Magazine, edited by Mary James, available now. You can go to our website, and there's a link there. You can dive into all sorts of great articles from North America to South America that dive into Passive House and climate action. Tomorrow on the showcase, we have this beautiful project, the All of Passive House, uh, and it, it will we'll dive into the details uh, the Passive House design details of this really cool house uh, designed by Alessandro Ronfini for his own family. So we hope you'll join us tomorrow for that. And then next week on Construction Tech, we continue this theme of looking at the embodied carbon, really examining the embodied carbon of our work. So this is going to be Tools for Tackling Embodied Carbon, presented by Steph Carlisle of the Carbon Leadership Forum based at the University of Washington, which is just a stone's throw away from where I live in Seattle. So please join us next week. Okay, so for the big announcement, um, beginning the first week of February, we're going to combine the construction tech and global Passive House Showcase series under one umbrella called Passive House Live. So Passive House Live will take place each Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Pacific. The construction tech edition of Passive House Live will take place on the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. And the project showcase edition will take place on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. So that means that we're asking for all of you to join us on Wednesdays rather than Tuesdays beginning this, fe this February. We're excited about this move for a number of reasons. First, we're excited to bring together the global Passive House showcase and the construction tech communities uh, together at Passive House Live. We're also excited to give our show hosts and our team more time to prepare great programming for you every week. And finally, we're excited to carve out a bit, of, a bit more time to build and grow our audience so that we can really deliver on our mission, which is to accelerate Passive House. So again, all of this starts on, in February, so it doesn't affect next week, um, but please spread the word and we can't wait to see you all on Wednesdays, moving forward, beginning the first week of February. Thank you. Great stuff, Zach. Thank you for all that. Thank you to all the new sponsors that have joined on. It's great to see that page expand. So appreciate everyone's efforts to help that out. And get ready, February uh, folks. It's going to be a good time. So our first hour is completed. We're now in the second hour. We got some questions to answer. So great stuff. And again, the big bad wolf is not blowing down this house. It is great to see with all these details. I appreciate the level went into and the questions are great. So Shannon, let's get on to the questions. Sounds good, Sean. And uh, yeah, you're welcome, Derek. We're, we're not gonna keep you up too late anymore. Our next question is pronounced hopefully correctly. Gokul Franjoti from NREL. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? So Goko asked, were there any additional spatial or special fire or electrical hazards you had to consider particularly with this project? Um, so I, I tried to answer that in the chat. I don't believe we did, um, but Abby and Janneke may know better. Yeah, did she say spatial? Uh, special, sorry, special consideration. Oh, special, but yeah. So yeah. Um, I believe the, the fire, the fire in terms of electrical, um, you run it in conduit. So, um, and then the plumbing, you just keep right out of the walls. Um, Yannicka, do you have anything to add on that? It, it's pretty. We, yeah, we, we technically didn't need to run the electrical in conduit. Um, there's not, there's not a requirement for it in appendix S it, the directive is to follow local electrical code. So, um, our code alternate request, which is what grants us the ability to use the straw bale wall system in this project, um, even though it's not codified specifically in Minnesota. The conditional approval we got to use straw bale through the CAR lists a specific line item that says building shall 
follow Minnesota Electrical Code, <laughs> um, which our builder wasn't wasn't gonna not do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just the the building official being really, really making it known that they're concerned about it. But there's there's not um, there's nothing in Appendix S that specifically says it's a you need to be concerned about it and this is how you have to deal with that. So they are like technically we have a line item in our CIR that says we have to do something special for electrical but what we have to do is just do what we would normally do. So in this project um, and Katie you'll have to remind me because it's been a bit since I thought about this the are we doing conduit or are we doing Romex? Um, I believe we were doing conduit yeah. just to like to make it so that the inspectors have nothing to, to throw at us and say that we need to change something. But the, the workshop that you did, you just put Rome. We just put it, we just directly yeah, buried it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say good move on that one because in my old basement, I've got some lime plaster and I've had some interactions with some Romex. So I don't know if it was the lime or not, but good mm -hmm. job going with conduit maybe. Just the, nice, the other <laughs> nice thing about the conduit is that that helped us land there is that we were you know it allows you to run future wire if you need to and so it's it's hard to do that without when you have exactly your it's fishable yeah and right what's you guys had this beautiful kind of theme in this project where you have redundancy without a lot of added uh or unique features and so you mentioned belt and suspenders before, but it's like the belt has a hidden pocket, right? Where you can hide your money. And it's also got platform shoes on, you know? <laughs> You've got a lot of really great uh, redundancy shoes. that doesn't seem to add cost or um, add complication, but instead add safety and simplicity. So well yeah. done. Um, our next question up is from Ian in Vancouver. Ian, would you like to unmute? Uh, I think it was nicely answered in chat, but it was just about uh, when you were going through the structural, I hadn't noticed any kind of cross bracing or anything. So I was wondering how you went about it, but it seems basically it's a pole barn in terms of its structure, right? It is, and it's also hurricane strapped. So if you oh. saw the, the construction photos, um, you can see the metal strapping, it's X, X braces um, of a certain particular thickness that our engineer specified. I'm smiling because of all of the hurricanes that we get in Minnesota, which is not very many. So um, it's a very sturdy- We got some tornadoes though. <laughs> yeah, we do, yes. Could be it's a very sturdy that. building. One of the, part of the belt and suspenders approach with regard to structure and why it is strapped the way that it is, is because, you know, we were essentially taking all of the load off of the bales, even though they are capable of handling shear within themselves, yeah. especially when you do a platform system like this, we were trying to assuage the concerns of this building, you know, falling over or rotting or doing, you know, you know, what any number of horrible things that they thought was going to happen to it. So it's a very sturdy structure, as it were. You might have calculated, which I've meant to, what the reduction in timber was in doing the pole barn type structure versus a more normal wall. Did you actually figure out what that would be? I mean, especially when timber was so expensive recently, this made more of a difference than maybe it will in the future. But as a thought experiment, it was interesting. I was wondering what it would reduce it to. That's an interesting question. Um, I think in concept, uh, a post and beam structure uses a lot less lumber than a two by four stick built or a two by six stick built. When you build post and beam at this scale with as many windows uh, that as this building has and with how the windows are, specifically how the bucks are supported in the exterior wall, they're double four by four on either side of every opening. Um, and so in concept, it uses less lumber in this building. I don't know that it did. Um, that's the short answer, I guess. And that, that's the distinction that I was sort of wondering that I hadn't gone down the thought process for. So that's good to know, good. And I've got some pictures of the, um, the X bracing that I could show right now just to, I don't know. Yeah, um, go for it. Make it interesting. So like here you can see, but, and I mean, they're pretty, it's pretty substantial. It's pretty overkill. <laughs> this building's going nowhere. Um, is, this all, is this Simpson stuff or is this just from somewhere else? This is actually, it was spec'd as a, as a Simpson brace, but it is um, just coil 
um, of a certain gauge. That's what they ended up backing off to, to try to save a little bit of cost. And is that the needle? Yes. And what, I have to know, what kind of thread are you using to <laughs> sew the bales together as yeah. a sewer? <laughs> Yeah, so it's just baling twine. Um, it's just the orange, orange twine that you can get at like Tractor Supply. So right. this was another like, compromise um, where it's again it's more plastic that we ended up having to use. Um, but you can't. There's no type of twine that it, of natural material that you can get tight enough on a bale. Um, we actually tried that with um, oh I forget with sisal twine, and it just yeah, unfortunately, it didn't work as well. We need another product out there. We need a braided twine or something. Yes. Sinew. Adam, can I uh, jump in with a just a, a question? First off, can I point out how awesome this background is going to be from now on? Yeah, it is. Really cool, Kevin. Nicely done. I'm claiming the uh, the role model of Andy Cohen. I'll promise to be uh, a lot more respectable than he was on New Year's Eve, but I probably have the same view with the mayor. Uh, but... <laughs> My real comment or question is, do you have a plan of, of hand applying the plaster in those coats or do you have a plan of spraying? Yeah, that's a good question. So we did a first trial with volunteers on like the front um, first floor um, and we just hand applied that. We are just plastering is a lot of work and it's like two and a half stories. So we're going to be hiring crew <laughs> to be able to do that. And so it'll kind of be up to the crew. Um, I'm honestly not sure. Um, but given how it has to be mixed, I would think it'd be hand applied. I would, I would look into, there's a few grout pump manufacturers um, uh, and they make a grout pump and they make a mixing. It, so it goes from a mixer, which is kind of like a concrete mixer. And then it goes right into a grout pump. And then sometimes you're able to rent them and then you could spray that on the wall. It might have an air assist, but I've been looking into the uh, grout pump system because our brownstones, if we can do triple, triple coat, uh, plaster properly and get all the details right, we may be able to get it airtight just like your building. But it does take a lot of labor and I think the machinery does help the process. So if you're mechanically mixing, dumping in a grout pump and then spraying on the wall and really only the hand labor goes into knocking it down or creating the scratches, it might speed up your process. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for that. You know, well. I was able to rent a grout pump once um, uh, from my local uh, yard. I'll, I'll share that one. In the, I'll share that one in the chat, which I rented. And then I think the IMAR company has like a full assembly of systems or so. But. Mm -hmm. And Katie, uh, Kevin presented last week. He's a dense pack cellulose installer. So I'm a machine nerd and an energy nerd as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the other comment I had that, you know, one of the presentations we had Chris Magwood on the show, he talked about the potential of, of like, I think he hinted at it, but I don't know if it's truly available yet, but kind of like a straw based cellulose like product that might be able to be blown in. If we could get that, we can combine the best of two worlds. I don't know where it is in the development personally, but I think it would be a great product to just get a low embodied, lower embodied carbon product, carbon sequestering within the process of doing typical cellulose but mm -hmm. if anyone has any that's a i heard that's a new r d product by brennan brennan air tightness and insulation <laughs> yeah they're sick of all the junk mail they get to use as cellulose <laughs> i think we can jump into the next phase mark do you oh, want to kick us off? we have another tradition and that's to go over our mentors right and uh how about we pause for for that time and and uh, Abby, Katie, uh, in, in whatever order you feel most comfortable, how about you, you, you share this with the rest of us? Or perhaps it's a mentee, right? Mm. Oh, on the spot. Um, I need a second. I, I, I thought we warned you guys. Sorry for putting you on the spot. No, that's OK. If and Abby, we can come that back led to you it. along we're... the way. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, come back to remember. it. Yeah, sure. we can come back to it later sure. on. Let me jump into another question and give you a moment to think about it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, don't want to put you on the spot. We'll put Aaron Jones on the spot instead. <laughs> Aaron, I know you have a question. Would you like to unmute? Uh, um, <clears throat> it was kind of already answered in the chat, but um, having been involved in a, in a straw bale project, oh, probably about 2000, um, you know, energy t details and uh, 
air sealing weren't quite as well detailed as they are today. Um, I was curious as to how we transitioned from the stucco to the sheathing on the roof. And uh, Jenna, I think, really answered that quite well for me, but I don't know if everybody picked up on that in the chat. Um, you know, obviously evolution in all things, right? And uh, I was still trying to figure out how to be a good carpenter 20 years ago. Never, never mind worry about an air sealing detail, like the <laughs> roof to wall connection. So um, <clears throat> yeah, anyways, Janet, thank you for that. And um, yeah, I can reiterate here just so that everybody knows if, if you'd like. Um, oh, absolutely. Please yeah, do. Yeah, Yannicka, please. So the um, moisture in the straw bale wall, it needs to be effectively managed, just like moisture in any wall. And the ways that you do that are twofold. One, you keep bulk water off the wall, which is why the building has three foot overhangs and why the bales are lifted off the ground so that there won't be any snowpack against the building, um, et cetera. And then you'd also need to minimize if not eliminate horizontal bale plaster surfaces so that water doesn't sit and penetrate. Um, and then once you do that, the plaster skin system, if done properly and if properly man maintained, actually does a really good job at keeping moisture out of the wall. And if moisture does get in, it's vapor open, so it dries, it's bilateral drying. So it dries to the inside or the outside, depending on where the push is coming from, um, from a humidity perspective. So it's it's, from a building science perspective, it's a very safe wall. Um, and then because of the compression of the straw and the thickness of the wall, there's not a lot of um, travel that happens. So there's, uh, it's a valid concern to be concerned about moisture in a straw bale wall. And it's also like if done properly, it's, it's very effectively managed. <clears throat> the air sealing detail is, needs to be continuous as passive house people, this is not news to us. Um, so that's, that's one of the trickier parts. And there's, I actually put in the chat 475, not that I'm getting, you know, <laughs> I'm not that I'm trying to make a big plug for them or whatever, but they do a great job with um, sponsoring these videos. And they did an awesome one on a straw bale build with Vermont Natural Homes and um, the 475 products. I think they use Exto Seal. Um, so essentially, after the first layer of plaster goes up on the building, um, and after the windows are installed, then there, there will be a masonry tape that is embedded in between plaster layers one and two. Or if your sequencing works out differently, it can be embedded in between plaster layers two and three. You wanna make sure you get it on there before you, you know, obviously finish. Um, but because it's masonry tape, it interacts fine with the plaster um, and it seals to the wood as well. And so you can do a really robust air sealing detail so you can keep that air, air, air tightness layer continuous around the whole structure. And Yannicka, as you were talking about the um, the compression, um, I had another picture that I thought might be interesting because um, someone had also asked about the um, what happens kind of at the the ceiling to the floor um, space. So I'm going to share my screen again, um, and I may even be able to share a small video of how this works. Um, but yeah, basically, there's these we call them bail stops. Um, it's just a you know, a piece of plywood and made into a box um, that is at the top of a wall. And you need to have those at the top of every floor because you can't have um, too many rows of straw bales up, like as you're building it, because they, they will tip out of the, of the building as you're, as you're building them. Um, and so anyway, you put these bale stops in and um, the bales, the, the six layers of bales will actually compress down about four inches. And so you're trying to stuff this 14 inch bale in there. And so we have this uh, masonite board that makes it a little bit smoother of a ramp. And then we're literally using a, um, a, a tamper um, to like whack it in there. Um, and it's just, it's a lot, it's compressing the bales and a lot of, a lot of pressure coming down there. Nice. Thanks for sharing that video. Excellent on the fly. And our next question, who do we have next is from Ben Larson. Ben, would you like to unmute? I know Ben's still around. Yeah, I'm here. Um, hey, I think she just answered it actually. My, that was my question. So <laughs> great job catching it. I really appreciate hearing that. These uh, construction photos are really invaluable. I mean, it really shows us the process of how it's done. I mean, a lot of us have heard about straw bale before, but we've never actually seen it in practice, other than what they used to do in the 70s and 80s, which was not quite what we do now. 
I'm sure it's a lot better and more improved. So kudos and good job. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And um, so we do have a blog on our website, and I think I linked to the straw bale or uh, uptown straw house at weebly.com. And so we have a blog that's kind of incorporating these construction photos, and we'll continue to add to them. Uh, we are missing Dan and Jean, but they did ask questions that I thought were interesting, and I'm not sure if they got answered. The first was Is the project all electric? Is there no gas on the project? So the instant hot is an electric instant hot. And um, following on that, for the other appliances, are you doing like heat pump dryer or induction cooktop? What, what are the other appliances looking like? So induction cooktop, um, we're not doing a dryer. We already hang dry. If we really need to use a dryer, the triplex is 20 feet away and there's a dryer in there. Excellent. I can take your bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Jean's question after that were, was, were the first floor electrical horizontal runs put in the pony wall? Yes. All right, simple, simple answer, simple question. Great, and our next question is from Eddie. Eddie, did you, or actually Eddie asked, and I think Janneke answered, uh, he asked if you could share your drawings and details with everybody and make them open source. And Janneke, I'll let you uh, answer that. It's definitely the goal. We've been talking about, there's a couple of hurdles that we have to cross internally before we do, but that's that's the plan. We're, one of the reasons we were so excited to push this through um, eventually <laughs> after a long time of back and forth with the city is because, the, and one of the reasons why we were so, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, militant about that is because we wanted it to be possible to do more of these for everyone. And so following on that thread, uh, sharing our details is like absolutely part of that story. Um, we just have to do a little bit more discussion internally on if there's liability stuff we need to work around. And I know that other firms have, have solved that. So it's definitely, it's gonna happen. It's just where we need to talk about it a little bit more first. Of course, yeah, you don't wanna, have any fine wines before their time? Does anyone else remember that? And I know Bob Kelly is out there chatting away, but I think I might have his attention. Bob, I have to apologize. I skipped over your question by mistake. Do you still have one? Yes, I do. Yeah, Excellent. thanks a lot. Yes. Um, so I was wondering about, you know, vapor diffusion inside a straw bale with, a, you know, a pure lime rendering. I mean, it's, it's an awesome combination, but, you know, throughout history, it's always worked, but I've never understood why and what the moisture levels are that makes it work. And I was wondering, did you ever dive into that? The, the bales will take on moisture throughout the year and it is important and, and you can't allow that to get over 20%. And so, you know, Andrew Morrison, he will not build in, um, in like the Southeast United States because it just gets, gets too moist for too long. Um, you know, in Minnesota, it does get hot and humid, but it, then we also get really cold and dry. And so it's able to then dry out in the other, in the opposite season. Um, so that's, what's really key about that. Um, just knowing like it will, the water will diffuse in and you need to be able to have enough time to let it diffuse out. So the materials, the straw is able to, is durable enough to go through that change of seasons over, you know, however many decades, centuries. Yes. Yeah, um, so the straw bale construction was really started on the plains um, when the baler, baling machines first came about and, and you know, in the plains, there aren't a lot of trees. And so they literally just stacked bales on top of one another. And so the, the oldest um, baled building that I've been able to find is I think from around 1920 um, and it's still standing. That's pretty cool. Good job. Mm -hmm. The rendering part's really interesting stuff, but that that's a whole other conversation and time frame. Uh, good job tonight. I just put a, a link in the chat um, of an article that John Straub wrote, I think in 2012, about the science of straw bale. If anyone's interested in um, how it gets wet and what it does to the moisture, um, that's a pretty, we used that early on when we were thinking about the system and it was helpful. Thank you so much for that. I think that's super helpful because I know there's a lot of misconceptions out there about straw bale and the biggest one in like all building failures is around moisture. 
So, you know, debunking that or, you know, getting those myths straightened out and the facts out there is super important because this is a really great solution to keeping things local and low carbon and uh, the local workforce too. So I, I really would love to see um, the results of the monitoring, the ongoing monitoring shared along with the drawings and details because it's gonna be a great lesson for everybody. Yeah, can we add to that real quick, just about the local yeah. materials piece? Um, just as another thought that went into this is like the urban rural divide in our country and just like being able, like I went out to, um, you know, Tracy's farm and we had just such a lovely conversation, you know, just we, we were able to make a connection that we wouldn't have been able to make before. And there, I, I just think that's another added benefit. Absolutely. I, there's a couple farms around me and they do events, some of them and have little Airbnbs and I'm like, this just screams for a workforce development camp. <laughs> you know? um, so I would love to bend your ear about that sometime, unless you want to talk more about that part of the process tonight. We do have some time. Um, we do have a question from Ratko. Ratko, would you like to unmute and ask your question? He asked, what sort of ongoing maintenance or inspection is required and what could go wrong? Yannicka, I don't actually know what the, the legal requirements are. Maybe you do. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm laughing again because the, um, the regulatory journey was so extensive and the, the, and it didn't, in some cases where you would think it would, it left us, would have left us with clearer answers. It kind of didn't. So, um, the, on paper, what we are required to do is build it how we said we were going to build it and then, um, keep it in good standing and maintain it properly, but they don't specify as to what exactly that means. So if you extrapolate what that would mean on this building, you maintain cracks in the plaster when they appear. Um, you monitor for moisture like we're doing, and if bulk water gets in and the bales get wet, you replace them. Um, and just like any other wall system, you like just monitor it for, for its condition over time. And then parts of it may need to be replaced for whatever reason. In a straw bale building that's designed this, the way that this one is, it's really unlikely that that's gonna happen, um, but you never know. And, and you know, Katie and Peter were fastidious, I will say, um, and that's an understatement in um, checking for moisture even beyond what was required by the code and by our code alternate request approval. Um, because they have a vested interest in the building, you know, not being wet. <laughs> um, and, and that is the one way that these buildings will fail. So um, I don't think that there's any point with the structure as it stands right now, we'd, we're pretty sure that there's no, no wet part of the wall. Um, and we're pretty sure it's going to stay that way. But it's just a matter of continuing to, to check it over time with the systems that we have in place to do so. Yeah, I will say our bales did get wet in one corner at one point because the roof was not fully ready when we were doing the workshop. Um, and so we had to take out the bales on the second floor, you know, northwest corner, northeast corner, and that sucked. <laughs> um, but we were, but that's why we were testing throughout the build um, because we'd rather take them out now than have a plastered wall and have it rot. Excellent. Bravo, bravo. That's using your tools while you're building, let alone for monitoring later. All right, well, I think, Mark, do you want to repose your question? Maybe these fine folks have had a chance to think about who might have inspired them. Thanks for giving me a moment to get my mute button. That thing is elusive, I swear. It, it's <laughs> like a tape measure. You, you think you have it, and then it's gone. Uh, so Let's go, uh, Boomer. What's that, Kevin? Let's go, Boomer. OK, Boomer. Uh, so. Uh, Abby or Katie, um, Kevin wants me to go chop chop here. So is there a mentor or a mentee that you would like to, uh, you know, tell us about? You know, I, I was thinking about that. And to be honest, I don't know that there's any one person, but I, I think, um, honestly, I always look to um, natural systems and like vernacular design and especially in the context of this project. Like, I think, I think that's evident. Um, yeah, I think there's so much to be learned from looking back at how we used to build uh, as we look to a future building, right? Just like renewing technologies um, and materials and whatnot. So that, that 
I'm going to hold with that right now. Yeah, as far as a mentor, um, I, I built a um, like a, a playhouse with my dad. And so like got into construction then. Um, we didn't build naturally at all, but that was it, an experience. Um, and so I wanted to do something hands-on that, that influenced the, um, the desire to do a community build and get my hands dirty. Um, and then also um, Hannes Hohenzener. Um, so when I lived in Austria, uh, one of the teachers there, um, he had been part of the build for the S house, which is um, in Niederösterreich. And they, um, yeah, it was one of the, like, it, it blows our house out of the water in terms of its low carbon um, uh, build. Like they, I mean, they even created these um, bio, um, uh, um, based screws in order to put a like to create a so they did the straw bale part and they did the, the plaster but they wanted to have like a rain screen and in order to attach the wooden rain screen to the building they create you know um, develop these bio-based screws um and so it's just it's super cool um and that's really kind of what inspired one of the things that inspired us to do this build i think i think this is the first time anyone has heard the technical side of bio-based screws so <laughs> That alone is why uh, uh, Kevin brought forward the mentor idea here. But that it, that's the thing you can tell when people tell their stories about experiences. It's that little nugget that you've had along the way. Uh, really, really love that part of it. Um, Shannon? Speaking of which, yeah, Mark, I want to jump in and ask you ladies, because I noticed how many girls were on the job site and... I'm always fascinated on how they got into it. So Katie, that story about your dad resonates with me. You know, the projects I had to do growing up or the things I took apart and tried to put back together, they poisoned me. I'm no good anymore. I have to, I had to go into architecture and, and you know, it, it's just, it's a, it's a sickness after a certain point. You can't see anything another way. So um, how did you guys find each other? How did you guys meet and, and, and what brought you together? Yeah, so I worked with Elizabeth Turner, who's the founder of Precipitate, um, eight, 10 years ago um, when I was at an energy modeling group and she was at an architecture group and we had a project that overlapped um, in energy benchmarking um, and we stayed in touch. And um, when she founded her own firm and I wanted to build something, I was like, well, duh, I'm going to work with Elizabeth. Um, and then, um, yeah, Abby had also worked at that same architecture firm and got to know her there. And then Yannicka joined Precipitate. So been great ever since yeah i have a feeling you're going to draw a lot more great people to you um and you've already done it tonight here with over 100 folks who have been singing your praises since you started so i think we're all out of questions for tonight yeah so i think that might be it for us and uh i want to remind everybody to save the chat by grabbing those three little dots at the bottom right of the chat and clicking on. Can I save just add chat. one thing, Shannon? Oh yeah, we're not in any hurry. So after <laughs> you save the chat, say sh show in folder, and you'll get a text file with all those great links that were shared tonight. And then in one week, this will be up live online on the Accelerator website, and you can watch it again. Uh, go ahead, Yanaga. We do um, a lot of advocacy at Precipitate, and so um, it's one of the you know, reasons why we're excited about this particular project and in addition to the myriad of other reasons why you could be excited about this project. Um, and our, as mentioned a couple of times, our regulatory journey was, was extensive and difficult and um, it almost didn't happen. And so I wanted to just put some stuff in people's brains, some ideas in people's brains, if you're thinking about how to do this where you are. Um, the first is that I will say, I don't know if any folks on the call have pull with local building code where you are, um, but if Appendix S, the straw bale building code had been adopted in the state of Minnesota, um, when they adopted the IRC, we wouldn't have had any of the problems that we had on the regulatory side. They would not have been able to put us through the ringer like they did. They wouldn't have been able to say no to the wall system after initially saying yes. They would have, it would have been a totally different journey. So that's kind of the, the like beacon. Since there is a straw bale code, if you can get your state to adopt it, that's like the best. Um, and then if that's not achievable within, you know, the time frame that you want to start doing these projects, we can still kind of lead to that. But um, additionally, working with the city 
bringing them in early and trying to get everybody at the table as early as you can. Integrative process style is, is definitely, um, you know, obviously very important for any project, but for the projects like this in particular, hugely, hugely important. And that's actually, uh, we had been kind of requesting that, and that isn't really how the local building code officials um, review process is structured. So it, it was not received well until we actually asked for it after they said no officially. And so it was kind of a backwards process, but if you can have that like, meeting where everybody's at the table earlier so that you can assuage all the concerns around moisture that is um that would have saved us a lot of time as well and we tried to do that but we're not we're not able to in this particular case um, but hopefully on the next ones we will be able to um, and then the the more people that ask for something when when you're not a one-off it's it's that much easier for um them to sort of understand that this is something they need to at least figure out how to implement and develop a process around and so we were you know one of three straw bill buildings going for permit in the last 20 years in minneapolis and that's one of the reasons why our process was so difficult because not only that's a huge span of time for such a small sample size but then also the other two happen to be very very bad <laughs> so um more people asking like inquiring with the city and like asking for natural based building biogenic materials um, and anything that we can advocate for on that front, like as a profession, that's like really what we need to be doing because the more they hear about it, it's less of a unicorn and then they will not be able to make you feel crazy for asking for a pretty normal thing. So. We know that story. We remember yeah. that. You know, we're only 10 years old over here with Passive House and there was a lot of crazy calling for a while or, you know, without the physics behind us, it was, you're just hugging a tree. It's always going to cost more. And uh, now we've tunneled through the cost barrier and we've got the metrics and straw bales came a long time before. So I think, I think we can get right back to the basics on that one. Al Bite, what's the women's wall? Oh yeah, it was literally just a wall that only women built. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, we, uh, so as part of our like recruitment for our community build, you know, we put out calls to everyone in our community and we also to um, like architecture students, like we had professors who then like emailed all their architecture students and it happened to be that like mostly women came to the build, um, which was awesome. And so, um, yeah, that was our kind of our, our, one of the days that we kind of were like triumphantly, let's get a cool picture. That's I'd so like cool. to know what sensors are in that wall because the performance goals are going to be hit there really well. <laughs> yeah, I like the competition piece for sure. Girls yeah. against boys. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for coming, Yannicka and Abby and Katie and anybody else who's friends with them or on the team or has supported this project. We're thrilled to have it as part of our programming and to have it in perpetuity on the website starting next week. So please come back and see us as you gather more information, as you move more legislation, and as you influence more folks. Mark Willie is going to tell you about the last tradition of the night, which is kind of a popcorn game. Mark, I'm going to switch my background. Or Sean, you guys take it away. Yeah, well, while well, Shannon switches her background, it, it, it's, a, it's officially the fourth T uh is uh is tradition and i'm gonna pass it to sean to kick it off tonight you're right and you know at sometimes we even get a 50 which is top shelf which is what kevin brennan did last week and which what you guys ladies did this week this was amazing like i love how we get to like the crux of it all and you dive into like your mentors and where this project came about uh i can't wait to see some final project or photos of when the project is finished um and hey, we'll have you back on too, because I'm sure there'll be more lessons learned in the, mm -hmm. you know, the next phase of it, but um, great. And I mean, all the city officials or any of the officials that denied you in this process, I hope they eat crow when this is all finished, because this is a project that it's going to be a landmark being, this is the future and it's right here. And as you saw in the chats, uh, um, all of the Fs get taken out with pH because we don't, you know, we're always talking about passives here. So. Um, and again, there was a new word, and I, I apologize, I don't have anything, but I, I, I'm worried about saying it incorrectly, but it was fe fastidious, I believe. That one gets a PH, too, and that's a, a, a great, yeah. 
All right, um, into what we're doing here. So, uh, Katie, we're going to start with you. Can you say the lovely words over my shoulder, starting with this section? Oops, over over there. Yeah, you're going to start with these words, and then we'll get you over here. And then, Abby, you can say next, and then we'll go through whoever's here to just have some fun as we wrap up our Tuesday night. Uh, for some people, uh, like John, it's Wednesday morning, so... We're having fun around the world today. Right. Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech. Technical, technique, technology. Hey. Over to you, Abby. Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech. Technical, technique, technology, tradition. Excellent. Odianica. Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech. Technical, technique, technology, tradition. Am I supposed to add one? You can add it in. You can go top self. <laughs> you can add any other T word too. It's, it's fantastic. So now, you can call on upon anybody who still has the screen on to do it as well. Or you have to have the screen on, okay. Well, I, I, then we know they're there. I vote Bob in Chicago. Bob likes this. I think Bob should do it with whoever's in the room with him. Yeah, yeah let's do it together. <laughs> it looks like you're having a good time in there, Bob. You know what, I am, but you know, she's an architect who's being introduced into Passive House. Good so, for her, bring her you brought hey, a friend. Bob did you his did homework. your homework. <laughs> Bob did his homework. He brought a friend. Great job, Bob. I brought a friend. Exactly. You got proof. She's real. Uh, well, anyway, I'll tell you what. Passive House, Accelerator, Construction Tech, Technology, Technical, Technique, te Technology. I'm sorry. And tradition. Uh, and tradition, of course. Who's going to do uh, this, hey, Bob? Passive House, Acceleration, Construction Tech. Technical, technique, technology, and apprenticeship is an obligation. Who's next, Aaron? Pick somebody to wrap it up. The mute button too fast. Um, well, I, I think we've got to put it, we have to put it back on Mark. I think we have to put it back on Mark, don't we? I think we do. Yeah, Mark. To get an All right, thanks, Rob. big dog. Yeah, apprenticeship is an obligation. And I love saying this. I love the beautiful inspiration of tonight and the technical technique and technology from Passive House Accelerator, Construction Tech, Technical Technique, Technology. Bless your hearts. And next time, Raka, I'm going to ask you to come on and sing it because I can see all your guitars in there and they are looking pretty sweet. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. Really great to have everyone here. Come and see us during January on our regular times on Tuesdays. And then starting in February, Passive House Live, coming on Wednesdays, cannot wait. We're gonna be more in the field. We're gonna have a lot of instructional stuff and we're gonna have the same old folks doing some great presentations. So come see us. We'll look forward to having you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you, Good night. Thank you. It's amazing, Abby and Katie. Amazing. Yeah. Really great. I'm going to stop the recording as everybody. Thanks, please. everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Abby. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming, Kathy.